Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Optimal Health Associates, COVID update, September 14, 2020. Uh, just back from fly fishing. For those of you who've watched some of these, I've been a little more sporadic because I've actually taken some time off to go fly fishing. The fly fishing season for me is pretty brief. It's just during this little part of the summer, so it's over for me now. So back to work, back to the regular old stuff. So I'll be doing these updates a little more regularly again because there's a lot of stuff to go over and I think as we enter the fall it's going to be more important. So let's talk a little bit about COVID in Oklahoma. 869 cases I believe were reported today. I think our total is around 71,912 deaths. I'll have a written uh, post tonight also with some of those numbers in picture form and I'm also going to put on the influenza vaccine efficacy data I went over last week on, uh, for people over 65. I'm also going to go over right now and I'll include the link or figure out how to include the journal article from the New England Journal of Medicine September 2nd looking at vaccine data. It's really interesting stuff um, because on one hand it, it's, it shows something really positive and on the other hand it goes completely against the narrative. So it's quite interesting how that all works. So the big thing going on with COVID right now is the cases are continuing to escalate as we're ending the summer. And as people are doing more things in larger numbers again, we're having more cases. So that's what's just going to happen. So let's think about a strategy again from the very get-go. What do we do? Because I've had a lot of people ask about this. So if on a baseline, I always want you taking a multivitamin a day, 5,000 of vitamin D, and there's some data that shows again that vitamin D is super repressive to COVID infection risk or you don't get as sick. And again, doing the supplements isn't so much going to stop you from getting the virus. It's going to protect you from getting as sick from the virus or perhaps even noticing you got the virus. And sometimes it may even fight it off without a true infection happening. But the bottom line is it gets your immune system re ready to fight it off in a normal way versus escalating into all this um, inflammation and allergic reaction type stuff that I've talked about. So vitamin D, multivitamin, melatonin, fish oil are your cores along with zinc, zinc, zinc. I've talked about zinc a million times. So those five things. So you want to take them regularly. The dosage for the zinc depending on weight is somewhere between 15 and 50 milligrams a day. If you're a big person um, over 200 pounds, 50 milligrams a day. If you're a person under 115 pounds, probably about 15 milligrams to 25 milligrams a day. If you're in between, you can do 30 or 50. Um, and then once you're on it regularly for a couple months, a month or two, go to um, five days a week. And you're gonna have really good zinc levels, which are gonna raise your alpha interferon, and then you're gonna be very protected against viruses, and alpha interferon also protects you against cancer. So then, if you get infected, what do I always want everyone to do? I want you to pulse the zinc. That means you take more of it that day at the first sign of infection. So generally, I would say somewhere between 150 and 200 milligrams, again, depending on size. So you take either a 30 five times in a day or a 50 three to four times in a day, um, preferentially in four to eight hours. You separate each dose by about an hour. You take it with food. So you want to get about 150 to 200 milligrams in that first day. You then take two days off because you've pulsed the zinc. The zinc, then your levels are high. It's very toxic to almost virtually all RNA viruses. So most cold and flu viruses besides uh, COVID. So that's your baseline stuff you always want to do along with your melatonin, your vitamin D. And I've gone over again the dosage multiple times. So if you look back, you can see that. Um, so that's what I always want everyone to do. If you get COVID and you're positive, call your doctor and let them know or your provider, your PA or your nurse practitioner. Some people will treat you, some people won't. That's not the big issue, but keep them in the loop so they know you have it. And you should, hopefully they should say, well, give me an update every two to three days. The things to watch for is increasing illness. So increasing, increasing respiratory symptoms, increasing coughing, increasing fever, feeling horrible. That's stuff to be concerned about. If you're a little sick with a cold or flu-like symptom, it's getting better and better and better. Hey, you're going to be fine. Okay. But the other thing, there's a break point with COVID somewhere 
around day five to seven a lot of times in the symptom chain where people can suddenly be going positively and then go down the tubes with respiratory symptoms or so coughing and shortness of breath. So again, if that happens, call your provider right away. So that's just a summary of how to approach COVID initially. Um, and that's what we want to focus on for a second. Now, the vaccine data was really interesting in this study. It's a New England Journal of Medicine article. I have to, uh, I'm going to give you the appropriate title before I, uh, no, of course, I, it's not up on my phone anymore. Oh, here it is. It's entitled Phase 1 to 2 Trial of SARS-CoV-2 Recombinant Spike Protein Nanoparticle Vaccine. These are the titles these things get. So basically, they vaccinated 83 people um, with the, I'm sorry, I'm saying um so much, um so much tonight, uh, with a, a viral particle. Some of them got an adjuvant, which is a, something that can make you respond better. So it turned out in that group that roughly the immune response was pretty good with the people who received the adjuvant and the vaccine. So think the adjuvants just helps your immune system respond. And so what they showed that was, so the good news is no one in this very teeny study of about 83 people who got the vaccine had any significant side effects to it. It's way too few people to tell anything. And that's it. And this is a summary at 35 days. But the, so the first thing is in this teeny study of people, 83 people didn't have any complications at 35 days. We need to see what happens at 105 days. Classically, that's you know three months or so. And then you want to see what happens at a year. And then in a perfect world, two years. But the initial month, no one croaked or had any problems in this small group. And then number two, what happened to their antibodies when they got both the vaccine and the adjuvant? Well, they went way up. And how did they define going way up? And this is where you go against the narrative. They were comparing it to convalescent plasma. So the authors basically said, well, here we have convalescent plasma levels in people who are sick and people who got mildly sick or severely sick. And we were getting the severely sick convalescent plasma levels. So we think it probably works. So here we have, <laughs> or has the potential to work. They didn't say it works. It has the potential to work. So here we have as the baseline thing that the vaccine is more likely to work if the antibody levels get to the same amount as someone who got COVID and was hospitalized and recovered. So again, they keep on saying the antibodies don't protect us. The antibodies don't protect us. The antibodies don't protect us. Turns out they're basing the entire efficacy of effect on reaching the convalescent plasma levels. Kind of interesting, probably illustrates that the, if once you get the virus, you're going to have some level of protection for a while. Uh, so important. The other thing that the this adjuvant, which I have to research more, um, one of the things they mentioned very briefly in passing, which I'll highlight, is the way the vaccine was made with the adjuvant is they were not as worried about this original antigenic sin concept or that it could set your immune system off worse or make you get more sick if you get COVID. And they just mentioned it in passing, but it's still an important point that the vaccine developers were actually looking at original antigenic sin or original antigenic seniority and were concerned that as they're making that vaccine, that vaccine's gonna give potential benefit but not then set you up to get sicker if you get COVID. And that was a great thing that the, the scientists involved were already looking at from the get-go when they designed the vaccine is how to avoid that. So that was very reassuring too. So uh, that's a positive on a vaccine data set. Again, we need um, a lot more data and we need a phase two trial and a phase three trial. And remember one thing to keep in mind, this data is completely different than what I've been talking about with influenza because these are, this is, these are, randomized controlled trials, which again, the influenza vaccine, which was the only vaccine I was talking about the other day. I'm not talking about all vaccines. I'm talking about influenza vaccines are, and they are, are they efficient? Uh, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about HPV, which is efficient. We're, we're not talking about measles, mumps, and rubella, which is efficient. We're not talking about, oh, um, 
meningen meningococcal or pneumococcal vaccines, which are very efficient and important. Um, we're not talking about tetanus, we're not, which is very important. And, and we're not talking about whooping cough, which is very important. We're talking about influenza vaccines only when we're doing this analysis. Um, and I go as I go through each cases. So that's just something to keep in mind because people had questions. Well, does this mean all vaccines? No, as I told you that night. And, and one thing people get mad when I present the data, I'm just the messenger. You can do whatever you want with the information I provide. I, I, like I said in the other video, it's up to you if you're over 65 to take the vaccine or not. Talk to your provider about it. This is the data. This is what it shows that X, this is its side effects, Y, um, this is the numbers of people who needed to be treated that I went over. And so you make the decision. I'm not saying don't take the vaccine or take the vaccine. I'm giving you the science and, and the science is what it is. I don't write the papers, I'm just going over them or verbalizing them for people's benefit. So you can make a rational decision versus a decision based on, oh, you just take the vaccine. And if you want to take the vaccine, just take the vaccine. Don't listen to the analysis of the data. And, and if you want to take the vaccine, but you want to understand why you're taking the vaccine, listen to the analysis. So that's really all I wanted to talk about tonight, except uh, finally, there's a reason just in general, sporting events in high schools and middle schools are predominantly closed. And it's because you can't, as you increase the number of people coming into a stadium, um, there's going to be more people, so more potential infected people. Even if it's a small amount, there's still more of them. They're going to be closer together at times, and then projectile of droplet spread, and then the entryways and exits and bathrooms are a disaster. So for safety, if for elementary school, high school, junior high, schools that are going with, hey, no spectators, they're being very careful and making, I think, a very good decision. I'm not critical of schools that don't do that, but I think if you're looking at it just if scientifically, that is what I would always encourage. But again, this is for middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools. Uh, we think we want to be very careful with spread of the illness. And it's not so much, I'm worried that they're, they're going to give it to the students if lots of parents come in or something, but they could inadvertently give it to a coach they could inadvertently give it to a referee. They could give it to their neighbor because, again, we don't want to be clustering in large groups. Um, and that's just my feeling on it. And that's based on science. And those are actually some of the CDC. That's a CDC guideline update from August 7th. And I agree. I do agree with that one. Uh, the only other thing you had said was um, autoimmune people taking the flu vaccine. Oh, autoimmune people taking the flu vaccine. I'll get to that this week. That's a sub separate subgroup uh, along with cancer patients. So we'll get to that group and th we'll also get to just the 18 to 65 year olds this week too. Okay, and then I'm just gonna ask a few questions on zinc pulse because every time you talk about it, then for the next several days we get questions. So do you wait for the positive result? No, you take a zinc, because you can do a zinc pulse if you just get a cold. I mean, the point of the zinc pulse is to knock the virus out before you even get all that sick. So at the first hint of symptoms, you do the zinc pulse. So again, you don't wait for a positive culture. The earlier you do the zinc, the more effective it's going to be. Just like when you add elderberry to it, you just, again, right away you do the zinc and you do 150 to 200 milligrams over four to eight hours, not 48, four to eight hours. And, we'll, and you can see how you do. Remember with food, because it can make you upset stomach or stomach upset so say you you do the pulse and then five days later you feel sick like you were talking about with the virus how often can you do the zinc pulse you can do the zinc pulse twice a week every week repetitively if you felt like it or if you felt sick yeah i mean i don't think you have to do that twice a week if you don't feel sick if you're doing the zinc pulse again once a week um you could just do a zinc pulse pulse every sunday um if you've been on zinc for a while and i I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. So I try to keep it simple with people. Just take your zinc Monday through Friday if you've been on it a while and then pulse it if you get sick. And then you can repeat it three to four days later, another pulse if you're still sick. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.